All right, then, if you have your Bibles, we'd ask you to turn to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 17, and we're going to begin reading in verse 14. Matthew 17, beginning in verse 14. The Bible says, And when they, meaning the Lord Jesus and his followers, and when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on me, my son. Uh, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic and sore vexed. For all times he falleth into the fire and off into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. And Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cure, cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could we not cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit, this kind goeth out not but by prayer and fasting. <laughs> Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for another opportunity to be with thy people tonight. Lord, we give you the praise for that. Lord, we thank you for the strength that we have uh, today. We pray that we would continue to rely on you. Lord, we pray for all the people that were mentioned. We pray for the young preacher that you would provide him a job that he might be here with your people. We pray, pray for the effort at Paris, Lord, that you might gain souls because of the labor that's gone into that. God, we pray for a continuance in that building that we might have a place to meet and to spread the gospel. Yes. Uh, Lord, we uh, pray for all the sick that were mentioned, Lord, that you'd be with them, with Don's Uncle Roy, that you would touch his body. And Lord, for the effort that uh, we intend to put in the paper, that you would place your blessings on that. Lord, now we pray that you'd bless your word to those that hear it. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, maybe some not so familiar scriptures. I've heard some preaching for this. And usually what I have heard is only two or three verses kind of pulled out of this text and focused on. But I believe to get anything out of the scripture, you've got to read the context and it's when it's given. And if you read that, it both humbles us and it kind of makes us take a step back and think that we really know, uh, are we really believing what the Lord has instructed us to believe? And so uh, in verse 14, it begins out, and when they were come to the multitude. Now, the they here are not just the apostles. And that's what needs to be stressed because there are special apostolic gifts. And we know that. And we know they died with the apostolic office many years ago. But this is not distinct to apostles. It said disciples. People that follow the Lord. Amen. People that are, uh, are astute to what he says and what he would have us to do. And, and so he says that when they were come, uh, excuse me, and, uh, and when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, now, this group of disciples is approaching the multitude. And if you will look at the examples of John the Baptist, the Lord Jesus Christ, and Paul the Apostle, this was always the approach. Now, there's nothing out, nothing wrong at all with getting out there and saying, would you like to come to New Testament Baptist Church? But if you've been doing it as long as I've been doing it, you'll find that that, is a, that doesn't happen a whole lot. They don't respond to what you say. But I believe we need to go back to old-fashioned street preaching out there where the people were and go by the example of John 
Go by the example of the Lord Jesus Christ and go by the example of Paul the Apostle. Go out there, not here. And, and so Amen. we find then that they're out there. The Lord Jesus Christ goes to the multitude and not the other way around. Now, when they get there, they have this one individual that runs to him and kneels before the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we don't do a lot of kneeling in the modern day. I've been to, I think, two Mennonite services, and, and when they pray, uh, and, and they are like old-time Baptists, the women sit on this side of the group, and the men sit on this side of the group, and when they, uh, when they turn around to pray, they get on their pew like this, and then uh, they pray before the Lord, and that, that's kind of what they do. And we find that with that kneeling, or laying out prostrate before the Lord, what we're doing is humbling ourselves. Amen. We're saying that, hey, you're God, and I'm a little pitiful man, and I'm coming to beseech you, and, and coming to beg you that you might intervene on my behalf. Amen. And that's what this man understood, and he knew. Now he describes his problem. How many times do you describe your problem before the Lord? And, 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 you know, sometimes I'm a little critical about, about just praying about health, and I, I understand that. But you know what? This is what the, the man was really twofold. He was praying about a spiritual condition, and he was praying about a physical condition. He was praying about both, and he was laying, he was laying it out there before the Lord and asking that he might intervene on his son's behalf, that he might, that he might, uh, be healed of the problem. So he says, Lord, have mercy on my son. Amen. Now, this is an interventive prayer. Uh, there's prayer of praise, which we do so little of, it's a shame. Uh, then there is prayer for yourself, and then there's prayer for others. Now, if you, if you ain't good at praying for others, wait till you have some children and grandchildren, and I'll guarantee you, you'll get better at it. And, and, and so we find then that this man is very, very concerned about his son. You, you know, uh, uh, what marvels things to me is in the day that we live today, there's no concern by parents for their children. And if you think about it, they're hardly ever with them. When Brother Kenny lived down in Georgia, he worked for a school, and it is a fairly big group the way he describes it. They didn't pick up their kids to nearly 7 o'clock at night. So they had been there from 7 in the morning to 7 at night. You squish them home, maybe have time to clean them up, won't have much time to eat with them, throw them in bed, and do it all over again. You know what? That's Satan's design. Right. Yeah. The Bible says train up your children the way they should go. That's my responsibility. It's not Stroke County government to train up my Amen. children. And, and, and so we find then that this man had the right idea and he was justly concerned for his son. I wish I could see more of that in the modern day. Lord, have mercy on my son for he is a lunatic. Now, when I was a boy, this, this word was used a lot more. Now, it means crazy or out of your mind. And how do I get this? And believe me, being in health care as long as I have, it's true. When full moon comes, these people get worse. Uh, elderly people get more confused. People who have psychosis gets worse. And women have babies one after another. It's just something about the, the lunar part of our universe, and it happens. So that's where lunatic comes, is lunar meaning moon, and, and that time is when people at their worst. So was he, psycho was he psychotic? Uh, I don't know what his problem was, but his, uh, his dad had concern. He knew it wasn't right. Now, we live in a day and age today where we don't have parents to say, hey, boy, that's wrong. Do it. That's what we need, is it not? As people say, listen, boy, that's wrong, and this is right, and you do right, or you can get your tail busted. 
that, that, that your, that your choices. You go to the house of God, and Lord, they can't even sit up and listen to the message because uh, they don't have parents that might intervene on their behalf. This is what this was a man that had genuine parental concern for his children. Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic. I want you to see that he called it for what it was. Right. We need to do that, do we not? Right. Now, you know what? If I took Bella to the doctor and she was eat up with cancer and the doctor came out and said, well, you know, Bella's just got a cold. Go home and wipe her nose and everything will be fine. I wouldn't want to hear that. I would want to say, yes, she had, I want to be honest with me, say she has cancer and we're going to try to do this, this, and this. Then why don't we as parents just say, yeah, he's got a real problem. And say he needs some help. Amen. And he, you know, some of my friends growing up in high school, the very reason they're in the shape they are in today is because mama and daddy turned their head. And, and, and so we find that this parent has the exact right uh, idea. The rest of that verse in 15 says, and sore vexed. He's a lunatic, and he's vexed or bothered or upset or moved all the time. For all times he falleth into the fire. Now listen, devil possession is a real thing. It happens just like it did in Bible times in 2021. It's still happening today. And it's always for the destruction of the flesh. Now, if you don't believe that, ask Judas Iscariot, and he'll tell you what the end result is being. Now, in the interim, the devil is your friend, and he's going to make you cool, and he's going to make you well-liked, but eventually he's done with you. And he'll leave you as a lunatic. He'll leave you hurting yourself. And, and the, whole, the whole goal was to destroy this man. You know what the, goal, the devil's goal is for you tonight? It's to destroy you. Yeah. That, that's his goal. And so he throw him in the fire, try to burn him up, throw him in the water, and try to drown him. And I want you to know this daddy just lays it all out there. He doesn't sugarcoat it. He says, this is the situation my son is. Could you pray for him? Could you cast out the devil? Yeah. And that's where we need to be. It's just say, hey, you know what? When we, when we talk to people, uh, out on the streets, we need to say, hey, this is how it is. Mm -hmm. and, and, and not sugarcoat what we're doing. Yeah. And so he finds that uh, the parent is genuinely concerned. Verse 16. And I brought him, meaning the boy, I brought him to thy disciples, again, not apostles, to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Right. Now, you ever been in a situation where you feel felt inadequate? Brother Jarrett, Brother Kenny, there are going to be some days you feel inadequate in the ministry. If it hasn't, ha it hasn't happened yet, it'll come. And uh, that's exactly what they couldn't do it. That devil was so strong and so mean and so obnoxious, they couldn't do it. And you're going to have experience that may be not facing the devil. Could be. But it, uh, it may be simply as getting up and preaching and nothing come out right. And if you've been preaching as long as I've had, it's happened more than once. And, 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 and so we see then that this young man, as he, uh, his daddy came to him and they couldn't do nothing with it. They, they couldn't answer. They couldn't, they could not get the demon to leave. Verse 17. And uh, Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation. Now, I want you to see that the Lord Jesus cuts down to the quick of the, the twofold problem that, the, that they, uh, they couldn't get the job done. The disciples couldn't do it. First of all, and that's what we're really going to look at, but we'll look at both sides of it. You're faithless. You, you don't think I'm able. You, you don't. Now, you know, we, we talk a lot about that. 
But then we begin, began to compare our faith, yeah. and we're pretty much the same or, or worse off. Yeah. First of all, do you believe? Do you believe devils, demons are still real? I certainly do. I, I fight them sometimes. They come against me uh, with everything they got. Because you know the Bible says this: resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So the reality of demons, the way I understood a third of them were in rebellion with Lucifer and they were cast to the earth. And you know what? They're still with us today. They're out there doing Satan's business. And they're very, very good at it because they have a lot more experience than you do. Amen. And, and so we find that one of the big issues in the modern day, and you again, again remember over 2,000 years later, how much more of a poor position we must be in. Oh, faithless, you don't have any. That's pretty grim terms, is it not? Uh, that, that, that's a, that, that's a, a, a shot in the shoulder. Oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. Yeah. Now, I want you to see he called him faithless and then he called him perverse. Pervert. We live in a, a perverse generation, do we not? Time where what's right is now called wrong and what's wrong is called right. Where men can marry men and women can marry... I read an obituary the other day, I guess this morning, and it said his he leaves behind he leaves behind his husband. And, and it just made me want to puke. Yeah. And, and, and that's where we live. Mm -hmm. It's all right to kill babies by the thousands. And I'll tell you what grows out of that, if you don't believe me, ask historic Germany. Next thing like people like my mama and your brother, they're off the boat. They're off the boat. You're good. That's a perverse generation. You're talking, he was talking to them 2,000 years ago. Look at where we're at today. You, you know, it gets down to this, and I'm not going to get political. It gets down to this where you believe. What is your value of life? Yeah. What is your value of life? And, and, and so we find them in, in, in this day that they lived. They were faithless, they had no confidence, they placed no faith in the person of Christ, and they were eat up with sin. So he said, bring a child to me. Verse 18, and Jesus rebuked the devil. Now, it makes me wonder this. They said they couldn't do it. So that says to me they had to try it. Right? Mm -hmm. They had to have tried, and the Lord Jesus rebuked him, just like in, in, in the Magic of Dara, how that there was 2,000 at least. I don't know where really they come up with that number because it's 2,000 hogs that died. I don't know if there was a demon for each hog or not. It may have been five demons for each hog. I know that it was so bad they couldn't stand it and kill themselves. So uh, be careful how you enumerate things. It's just like in the Christ mass story, we three kings of Orient are. It wasn't three kings, it was three gifts. I don't know how many wise men from the East came to you. And, and, and so we find that as these people, uh, as this de devil is thrown, is thrown out of this, and, it, and Jesus rebuked the devil, and he, meaning the devil, departed out of him, and the child was cured from the very hour. Now, I want you to notice those two words. Cured is related to disease, like hearing loss and high blood pressure. The devil left, and the person was healed physically. Now, I speak, unfortunately, from a lot of personal experience. Illness is real. But a lot of illness we've seen is caused the cause by spiritual things. Mm -hmm. Now, if we get right our life right with Christ, I believe illness would be a lot less. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, is it going to be there? Sure it is, because we live in a rotten, stinking flesh that was cursed from the day it was born. Amen. But I think our lives could, uh, I, I think our lives could be a lot more happy. So spiritually, he got right, and then his health improved. He was cured from that very hour. Verse nineteen. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, why could we not cast him out? Now, I think this is funny because it shows the pride of the flesh. I mean, when, when this big demon went out, they didn't say, amen, hallelujah. That's right. They went and said, man, why couldn't we do it? Let's whisper about it. Let, let's hide our lack of faith. You, you know what? A lot of times what we do is hide our lack of faith. We pray and bless His holy name, and then we get home and start counting keys. Right? That, that's the nature of the flesh. That is a faithless generation. That is where we're at. We live in a day where the devil would have us to be bound up in our in our little buildings and and, and waiting any minute, hoping, hoping and praying that the Lord comes back. You know what? He's not coming back until it's time. And he left us very specific and uh, instructions yeah. on the uh, Mount of Ascension that said, go ye into all the world, yeah. and he didn't give us a stopping spot. So apparently that's what we're still to be doing. Amen. And so we find here that they were a little embarrassed and to hold their flesh, and as the Lord Jesus Christ frequently did, he answers them very directly. And Jesus said unto, unto them, because you're unbelief. Remember he said, faithless generation. Because of your unbelief. You know, the, the bigger the problem you face, probably the less faith that you have. Now, that can be money, it can be food, or it could be quite literally casting out death. And the reason we can't do it is because of unbelief. Mm -hmm. Because of our lack of faith. Yeah. Because we do, not, uh, we do not think he's able. Listen, we serve a God that we don't even understand. We serve a God that can bring cold, gushing water out of a rock. Uh, we, we, we serve a God that can rain food out of the sky. We serve a God that can cause food come to a person. <laughs> Elijah up on the mountain, and he got two meals a day and did nothing, nothing to contribute to them. But you know what had to happen first? He had to be obedient. <laughs> I want, you know, one of my favorite parts of the Bible is when the book, the book dried up. You know what? One solution may only work for a very short time, and the brook may dry up, but I'll guarantee you there'll be instruction behind that, and he's got another plan. I want you to go over. There's a widow. <laughs> I love that. There's a widow that I have prepared. <laughs> he always prepares something for us, does he not? And, and, and so we find what we need to do as New Testament Christians is work on our faith. But Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if ye have a faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, remove thee hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Now, we ever, ever forever have people trying to spiritualize this scripture, and I understand that it can mean problems in your life, but you know what? I serve a God, if he wants smoky, the Smoky Mountains over in the Cumberland River, he can still move them today. It's all under his, uh, it's all under his authority. You say, well, why don't we see stuff like that? Because of your own belief. Because of our lack of faith. Yeah. See, uh, we God is not changed. Uh, if I understand the scriptures, that's an impossibility. That God can't change. So it has to be us, does it not? Mm -hmm. 
having that level of trust is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Is it not? <coughs> that level of belief, that level of confidence in a God <laughs> that we've never even seen. Yes, it's difficult, and that's why he said just a grain, just a smallest thing you can think of, have that kind of faith. How be it, this kind, meaning this type of demon, this type of devil, that, that, that brand of devil, this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Now that tells me two more insights to these disciples. They weren't much prayers and they weren't fasting. Because apparently if they had been, it would have happened. How much do you fast? Listen, that's not a new. That's not an Old Testament teaching. Uh, we're still to fast today, right? We're, we're, and and we're supposed to fast for the right reasons. Yeah. All right. And then when you are in a fasting time, shower, put your deodorant up, and the biggest smile you can put on your face, and don't you let even your spouse know about it. You see what I'm saying? That's, that, that's the type of fasting the New Testament uh, uh, calls for. And so we find then, we see that faith was a problem with New Testament believers even when Christ was still on the scene. Now go with me to Mark, uh, Mark chapter 4. Read another, probably a lot more familiar verses of Scripture. Mark 4 and verse 35. Mark 4 and... Uh, Verse 35, the Bible says, And the same day when even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. That was his command. That was his request. And it was to be followed. When the Lord Jesus gives you a command or a request, do you follow through? Uh, when he says, Go ye into all the world, he was addressing the church, but since I'm in the church, that addresses me. Very difficult request, and it is. It is a difficult thing to get out there and preach the gospel in the middle of a public square to people you don't even know. You know, it's quite easy in this little building here, people who are my friends and my family. But when you're out there and you don't know one of them, it becomes quite different, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. it? It becomes something that that is a little bit more of a challenge to grasp. And, and so he gives them simple instructions. We're going to the other side. We're going to make it. You know what, church? One day, we're going to the other side. The question is this. What are you going to do on the trip? What are you going to do till we get to the other side? Now, verse 36 says, And when they had sent away the multitude, they dismissed their people. They took him, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. So a big group of people, uh, uh, of the church people going over, and there arose a great storm of wind. Now we have storms here and we have wind storms. Uh, mostly in Tennessee, it's tornadoes. Our straight winds aren't as bad, but they can be. Um, there was no rain. There was wind. You know, the scriptures can, Nicodemus, he, uh, the Lord told him the, the wind bloweth where it listeth and you can't tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth. And you can't control the wind. Right. And you know why we don't like that? It makes us to feel pretty helpless. And whatever comes your way, if it's good or bad, illness or, or prosperity, you're not in control of it. No. And that makes us feel very, very inadequate, doesn't it? It makes us feel very vulnerable, does it not? Uh, and, and so we find that the Lord Jesus gives them simple instructions, and then the first thing you know, huge windstorm on the way, and the thing about windstorm, 
storms on the sea is it gets the sea a churning. It gets things moving about, and then we become even more scared. Listen, church, I'm here to tell you, if you don't know it yet, the waves are blowing, the wind is, is moving things, the sea is churning, and it's not going to be good. And you better understand, do you trust the Lord or do you not? Yeah. Do you think he's ready to still run water out of a rock? Do you think he's still able uh, to rain bread out of heaven? Because I believe that takes faith, does it not? And even then, they didn't have the faith they needed. Remember how he said, on all the days except the Sabbath, Saturday, you take one portion. On Saturday, you, on Friday night, you can take two. And they still just try to hoard it away. Mm. You know what it is? That, that's the flesh at its best. <clears throat> Do you have any faith? Is it something that you can stand on? Is it something that you can dwell in? The faith that you have placed in the Lord. And, and so we find that he, in the midst of this storm, verse 38, and he was in the hinder part of the ship. Now that's at the back. And they were facing these wind like this with the front of the ship. And uh, me and Brother Kenny, we was going over the bridge at Paris uh, Friday. We saw this old, we saw this little boat. And y'all know how the waves get on that part of the lake. And man, they were churning. The wind was blowing. And he was skipping over those waves, just flying through there. Now, I'll say this. If he didn't have that big 500 motor behind him, he'd been going the other way. Because see, as the Bible says, the winds were contrary. And he looked big and bad with that line. And it was cool. I thought he was going to hit the pier, but he didn't. <laughs> uh, but see, you didn't have that then, did you? Do you trust him? Do you have faith? Do you think he's able? Is he bigger than the storm? Can he provide something out of nothing? That, that's really what it gets down to. And, and, and we've got to realize that and grow our faith experience by experience by experience. And listen, you'll be put in some that, listen, you won't like, and you'll begin to get the homie drummies. Listen, uh, the Lord showed me one time how little and insignificant my nursing degree is and my nursing license when I got laid off and there were no jobs to be found. You know what? When I grew up, walked across that stage and I got my license from after I took my boards, I thought I'd never be without a job. But I'll tell you what, God showed me quick. I worked for a year at the nursing home, a year at home health, and you know what? Then I got the pink slip. And I looked and I tried to get on at the hospital down here and I applied at Clarksville. And it's about 40 days, 30 or 40 days. I didn't have a job. And just had them kids stair steps like this. And didn't know what I was gonna do. But I learned this, <laughs> that I couldn't trust in myself. Yeah. I told you this many times before, a company that went out of business and the reason I got laid off, I, I had bought into the retirement plan. And because the company went out, they paid everybody out. Went down to the mailbox, had a check for about $3,500 in the box. And I knew from that day forward he was able. And it wasn't it wasn't extravagant. We were just baby to get around to everybody uh, enough. I won't say we paid everything, but we got around to the important stuff. About three days later, Clarksville used to be the old Clarksville Memorial Hospital then, and said, uh, "Would you like to work for us?" And I said, "You just don't know that." And but God is able. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And he might put you in some very precarious positions. Yeah. And what it is, is to grow your faith. Yeah, yeah. It's to grow your faith. He hasn't left you alone. Mm -hmm. So you know the rest of the story. They ran in the back of the ship. Lord, save us, let's we perish. And, and don't get down on them. You've done the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> and he says, oh, I love this though. Oh, ye of little faith. <laughs> he didn't say because you have no faith. He says, you have little. 
In other words, he followed the instructions till the waters got rough. <laughs> he said, go to the other side, and they were rowing and rowing, following God's plan for their life, and then the wind started hitting them in the face. Yeah. And you know what? It's going to hit you in the face, too. Yeah. It's going to hit me in the face. You know, the next time I'm looking at myself now, at 52 years old, the next time I get the pink slip, it probably ain't going to be as pleasant as it was when I was 27. Mm. You see what I'm saying? But you know what? It'll be a test of my faith. Right. It'll be a test of my faith. And so where have you placed your faith in? And I, I never can quite accept the way man is created. How we can place our never dying soul into his hand for safety mm. with that kind of faith. And we can't trust him to pay the light bill. <clears throat> right? And you know what? Your lights might get cut off. Y'all come over to the house. We go to wood stove. I ain't going to say we're going to have lights either, but at least we'll have a place to cook. You see, sometimes it takes that, does it not? It, it, it takes a building of your faith. And that way, at the end of your life, you can say, I'm now ready to be offered in the time of departures of hand. Because you, you, you live by faith. And it is a learning thing. Uh, it takes time. But you try the Lord Jesus Christ. You, you say, I trust you. And mean it. Mean that you truly trust him. And he'll grow your faith. Now, when you pray this and say, Lord, grow my faith. Listen, it's not going to be pleasant. And if you pray that prayer, you better mean it. And uh, he'll grow it. It won't be pleasant. It won't be fun. And you won't be walking across the Cumberland River. But he'll do it for you. And then the next storm comes, you'll be a little bit more ready. And maybe instead of, oh ye of little faith, oh ye of moderate faith, <laughs> right? He grows our faith if we let him. Right.